Steve Keen. He's a professor of economics and also he's proud to be the world's first crowdfunded economist. Steve Keen, you describe yourself as an anti-economist. Both are examples of what many modern economists missed and examples of what they may continue to miss because my guest says not a whole lot of thinking has changed. He's Steve Keen. Hi, I'm Professor Steve Keen and you are listening to Left Out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Left Out. Uh, my name is Dante Delavalli and I'm joined always by Paul Sliker and Mike Palmieri. Um, so before we get into the episode, as usual, I just want to let you guys all know, first of all, thank you to everyone who has supported us on Patreon or is engaging with us, sending us in questions. We love it. Um, we put it in our episodes. We have them in this episode. It's three dollars to stitch in your audio from a question. All you need to do is leave us a voicemail. You pay yeah. us three dollars on Patreon. We know everyone's hurting in this um, in this economy right now. Yeah. But... Well, you know what? Let me let me walk that back so they make this clear. Um, definitely looking at the kind of responses on social media. I don't think it's clear people understand what we're trying to do here. So we'll always take questions on social media. Um, but if you were to be a Patreon contributor. Uh, contributor for $3 and you call our Google voicemail number, which we have posted on Patreon, you, you the, the question that you ask will then be stitched into the episode itself. You will be left out famous. Yeah, you'll be left out famous. Um, you will not be left out. But I just want to make it clear that it'll sound as though you are asking that person the question. Okay? If not... That's fine. We'll just read your question in the episode. And that 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 person will actually hear your voice. Yeah, and that person will hear your voice. We'll like play them the recording. It'll be super cool and and, and hopefully we're we're doing a good job now that you understand what we're trying to do here. Exactly. All right. Enough about that and all the technicalities. Let's jump into this episode. Yeah, done. So, so what do we got going here? So we're really, really excited um, to have uh, talk to Steve Keen. He's an Australian born British based economist and author. Uh, he was formerly an associate professor of economics at University of Western Sydney, um, and then in 2014 he became a professor and head of the School of Economics, History, and Politics at Kingston University in London. He's also a fellow at the Center for Policy Development. Uh, professor Steve Keen just came out with a, a book that's only, I think, 147 pages, but it's probably the most useful 147 pages, in my opinion, hmm. that's came out over the past year on economics. It's called Can We Void, Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Uh, pick up the book. Uh, professor Steve Keen's a pretty pretty special economist in, in that profession in the sense that he is a heterodox economist, which is what we focus on interviewing on this show quite frequently. But he actually was uh, the, the first economist to accurately predict the 2007-2008 financial crisis, I think, early as 2005. Uh, yeah. So um, without further you know, ado. Without further ado, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Left Out. All right. So uh, welcome to Left Out, Professor Keen. Good to be here. Um, I, I would like to just start off uh, with you kind of briefly describing how you got into the economics profession and just kind of give a you know a short little uh, biography of, of how you ended up doing this kind of work. Sure, I'm going to give you a lengthy one if you like. Uh, I was a fairly sharp uh, school student, and when I did economics at, at uh, school, I had a couple of very good lecturers as well as teachers who kept me inspired in the subject after having six years of lousy physics teachers who turned me off physics, unfortunately. And I got to university expecting to be using some of the techniques I've been uh, picked up from some of my teachers, which involved dynamic, uh, dynamic analysis. And I was also doing mathematics at the same time. And I was horrified by what passed as mathematical studies for economists. So incredibly simplistic, uh, simultaneous equations and things like that. And very cumbersome methods of proof. So as well as being a, 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 a sort of starting off in the, if you like, the right end of the spectrum, believing in what I was taught in economics at school, which was that everything works perfectly. If you only have markets and if you abolish monopolies and unions, everything will work well. But I also wanted to see this put in a dynamic sense and I saw nothing dynamic in what I was being taught in economics. And uh, then I had a lecturer drive a truck through my... 
confidence that conventional theory described the world accurately with what's called the theory of the second best, which he explained to a first year class. Uh, at which stage, if you if you have if you hear this stuff when you're at the master's level, you've already absorbed so much nonsense that it doesn't strike you as absurd. But if you start off and say, hang on a second, this theory turns upside down all the conclusions I thought applied about you know, what's the advantage of having you know competitive markets versus having unions and monopolies. I thought if the theory is this easily overturned by a simple concession to reality, uh, as it was using what's called the theory of the second best, there's got to be something wrong with the theory. So rather than relying upon the textbooks, I started reading the journals and uh, was horrified to find that there was a debate over the very nature of capital uh, in, the, in the annals of the economics journal and a range of other influential journals, which the critics of the conventional theory won. And was this conceded by Paul Samuelson in uh, slightly after that in the, in the mid 1970s? And I realised that what I was being taught wasn't an education at all; it was an inculcation. I started reading more broadly again, and uh, as it happens, at the end of the Vietnam War, Australia was one of the foolish countries that joined America in that pointless excursion. Uh, all the energy that was bottled up in people like myself to oppose the war was suddenly liberated and we started taking on how we were being taught. This is back in 1973 at Sydney University. And what started as a strike over teaching of uh, uh, philosophical aspects of feminist thought in the philosophy department being blocked by one of the professors led to revolts in all sorts of departments, including economics. We took on the professors and won a campaign to have a Department of Political Economy established. So that's right back in 1973. And it was the only, I think Sydney University was the only university on the planet that had a group complaining about the teaching of economics, a formal group in that sense. And ever since then, I've been looking at economic theory and thinking this is dangerously deluded nonsense. It doesn't actually describe capitalism. And whether you're a critic or a fan of a system, you need to describe it accurately before you can make any sensible judgments. So I've, since 1973, been campaigning in various ways for the reform of economics but I knew at the same time you wouldn't have any success on this front unless there was a, a economic fail, failure that was completely caught the mainstream by surprise oh. and exposed to the public that this theory just doesn't work. And, of course, that was the financial crisis of 2008. So, so, so Steve, that's probably when I came Steve, to prominence. Let, 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 let me stop you there. Let, let's get in a little went bit far more. too long. Specific. on that. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's that, that was perfect. But let's get into that a little bit more. So... So you're a heterodox, okay. you're a heterodox economist um, or an unorthodox economist, meaning you're not in the mainstream uh, of the economics profession, and you're also one of the handful of economists who were able to see the uh, 07, 08 crisis coming, as you sort of alluded to there. And it was in as early as 2005 you warned of it. Uh, you actually received the the Revere Award from the Real World Economics Review for being the economist who most cogently warned of the crisis and whose work is most likely to prevent future crises. What makes your work uh, fundamentally different from, from other economists in the mainstream uh, profession? Well, in terms of the comparing to the mainstream, the mainstream has got several obsessions about how one has to do economics. The first is that you have to model the economy using equilibrium as an incredibly important organizing principle and they'll spend their time working out uh, what is the equilibrium meaning meaning a situation which means that everybody engaged in this uh, can't gain by changing so it's, a, it's an equilibrium that satisfies everybody's uh, objectives as best they can satisfy them that's a major obsession with how the neoclassicals work that is really a hangover from the 19th century when if you wanted to analyze something as complex as capitalism the original neoclassicals people like uh, William Jevons and, and Alfred Marshall said, well, we really should be doing dynamic analysis, looking at change through time, but that's so complicated. Let's do the static stuff first and presume we're working with an equilibrium system and leave it to our successors in the 20th century to develop dynamic methods. And frankly, that's what they expected to have happen. Now, because, in, in fact, the equilibrium uh, models did not reach the conclusions they wanted. It's a bit like being given an insoluble puzzle or giving an insoluble puzzle to somebody who's got autism. Uh, they'll just continue trying to solve the puzzle. And that's fundamentally what neoclassicals have done. Rather than developing dynamic uh, analyses, they've stuck with an extension of the static stuff of the 19th century. I say let's use modern uh, late, 19th, late 20th century techniques. 
known as complex systems approaches, which model systems that are continuously out of equilibrium. In fact, they're normally far from equilibrium. And that was originally developed in meteorology, but these techniques have been around for half a century now. So I work in non-equilibrium analysis. Uh, the second part of the mainstream is people think economists are experts on money. In fact, in the very the beginnings of the, of the discipline with Adam Smith, he dropped this little term about saying that humans are the only creatures that barter. And this was a barter model that became dominant in both the classical school and the early neoclassical school, saying money was just a veil over barter, so let's ignore money. Now, that's nonsense. A capitalist economy is fundamentally a monetary one. But that belief that it's non-monetary meant that even in, even in, in 2007, uh, the, what's seen as the canonical neoclassical model uh, by a guy group called Smets and, and, and Wooters, uh, published in 2007, had, I think, seven fundamental equations to it, none of which involved the financial sector because they thought the financial sector smoothly reflected what was happening in the real economy and they actually derived what they saw as results about inflation and so on from projections from a model in which money, banks, and debt played absolutely no role. I think it's totally deluded, so I work for a monetary model. And the final difference is they also believe that you should derive the model of the overall system from the model of the individual parts that make up the system, which is people see that as reductionism. I mean, you reduce a big problem to a small one and solve it. In fact, it's the opposite. It's what's called constructionism. So you believe you can start from understanding the components of a system and then extrapolate from those components to the aggregate. Now, that is a fallacy in anything that is actually a genuinely complex system, which in the simplest level means a system where interactions between the entities in the system are change depending on how far you are from the equilibrium and that's a that's a, a non-linear system so because we do live in a complex system where what you do affects what happens to me and vice versa where feedbacks are important uh, that is fundamentally a false system and my, my best analogy for it was if it were true the way you'd work out the properties of water is by working out the properties of a single molecule of uh, H2O and then extrapolating those. And that would have to mean that there'd have to be not just these things as a water molecule, but it'd be a steam molecule, and my personal favorite, a snowflake molecule. There's no such thing. Uh, water, H2O forms into water or steam or snow or sleet or ice under different conditions affecting how the molecules interact with each other. So even water is a complex system. Now, economists model it as though it's a simple linear system and you can mm -hmm. extrapolate from individuals. You simply can't do it. So I, I work from the macroeconomic down, and on that basis, my models uh, predicted the financial crisis long before it happened because it covered the feedback effects that the mainstream leave out. It involved money, which they leave out, and it was non-equilibrium, and they also ignore non-equilibrium situations. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So let's make that a little bit more concrete uh, for our listeners. I think that a lot of people uh, that aren't economists, which is the vast majority of folks, uh, generally think generally of the economy, people. <laughs> generally think of economists, uh, you know, they, they generally think the way the economy works in terms of supply and demand. And economists have, have come up with, as you've mentioned, these complex mathematical model mathematical models that are based on some pretty fantastic assumptions. Um, explain a little in, in the most simple terms, um, uh, the ones that are used um, in, in mainstream macroeconomics, specifically as you were sort of mentioning the, the DSGE models, the models of the neoclassical tradition or mainstream tradition, um, what that economists use as a basis of modeling economic activity and why they might be a bad way to model capitalism. And, and some of our wonkish listeners might know that although, although they, these are macroeconomic models, they actually derive, as you mentioned, from microeconomic foundations. And, and, you know, in other words, starting at the individual, the rational consumers maximizing utility and, and firms who are maximizing profits um, and, and they've got to reach equilibrium in, in, in their models. Can, can you just go into that a little bit more, but in the most uh, simplistic terms for some of our listeners who are new, new, totally new to this info? Okay. Well, the mainstream models, and they're called dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, as you mentioned, DSGE models, and that sounds really advanced and complicated, and in fact, deriving them 
mathematically is an, is an incredibly tortuous process. But what they start from is the belief you have to drive the macroeconomy, what happens at the aggregate level, from the behaviour of individuals. And they started off initially with the idea of what they call a representative consumer, on one side, maximising utility by making a choice between work now, which gains income, and leisure now, which means you relax and enjoy the income you've earned. So there's a leisure labour trade-off for the household in deciding how much labour it supplies to the factories. Uh, the factories also happen to be owned by exactly the same individual. So this consumer, who was a worker, was also a capitalist, owning the same firms and then making a labour leisure trade-off to decide how much to supply to the factory that he owned uh, to produce output which he then consumed to maximise his utility over an infinite time horizon. So they presume you make decisions now about what to spend based on uh, what you expect to be the conditions for both technology and your, your tastes over an infinite time horizon. Uh, and therefore, if there's a change in the interest rate, that will change uh, the labour leisure trade-off for you over the, over the infinite future, and therefore the interest rate will have a dramatic effect about how much you consume. Now, if you think it's total fucking bullshit, you are correct. It is total fucking bullshit, but that's what they <laughs> believed. And, and the reason they do it, actually have to track back and say, well, why on earth do they have this idea of a representative consumer in the first place? Why not have two classes of consumers, wealthy consumers and poor consumers, or dare I see these terrible Marxist words, capitalists and workers. The reason was that they, when, you, when you go through microeconomics and you learn how to derive a demand curve, and this is an important part in the inculcation of a student into believing the neoclassical theory, they start from saying, well, individuals can be described as having preferences, and these preferences are between different goods are shown effectively like isobars on a weather map. You know, you'll see all these curves you're used to seeing on the TV screen, linking points of equal pressure. Well, they'll say we can use exactly the same idea to talk about the utility you get from consuming different numbers of goods. And the more you consume of each good, the more utility you get, but at a higher level. And so what well, they show that you can have, you know, like you might consume lots of bananas and very few biscuits, or lots of biscuits and very few bananas, and both you can find combinations of biscuits and bananas that give you equal utility. That's what they call an indifference curve. And that's, they then say, that's your preferences, and then they say you decide how much to actually consume by having a budget. And they'll say, well, your budget consists of an income, which we take as given, and then relative prices between bananas and biscuits. And if we keep the price of bananas constant and vary the price of biscuits, the cheaper we buy biscuits, the more you can buy of both bananas and biscuits because the drop in the price of biscuits actually increases, not just makes it cheaper to buy the biscuits, but it increases the effective income uh, that you've got because we're keeping incomes constant and dropping one of the prices. Well, they didn't fiddle around a bit and say we can compensate for that by by changing your income a bit so there's no income effect. And what we get is a pure substitution effect, as they describe it. The lower price of biscuits necessarily mean you consume more biscuits. Profound, da-da-da-da, blow the trumpets, etc., etc. Now, then they go on to showing you the market demand curve. And some mathematical economists realise, well, in fact, we've all done so far as to arrive an individual's demand curve. We've shown that shows the individual will demand more biscuits as the price of biscuits falls. Can we aggregate that to an overall market? Because, of course, what we're doing to begin this analysis is assuming that changing the price of biscuits has no impact upon your income. But if we have an overall economy where some people are biscuit producers as well as biscuit consumers, then when we drop the price of biscuits, we drop their income as well. So we have to take that into account. Now, the, the, the way that if you can actually try to visualize this, uh, what they had was when they were doing the individual, they presumed that they could vary the price of biscuits without varying the price of bananas and without varying your income. So if you look at the number of bananas you can buy, that didn't change. That remained constant. And so your, your curve to help you, your straight line, which gives you a budget, was used to derive your a d demand curve that showed you the maximum points of utility you could get with every different price combination, that point didn't move. But as soon as you say, well, we're looking at more than one market, more than one consumer, and we're looking at well, goods which are both luxuries and goods which are necessities, they couldn't make that a comment anymore. And what you get out of that is when you aggregate, because that point that pivot point is no longer staying fixed, it's varying as you have relative prices. Mathematically, that meant that rather than the 
if you, you start with, if you start adding up the demand curves of individuals, all of whom have got perfectly well behaved downward sloping demand curves, when you aggregated them, you got a demand curve that had any shape at all that you could draw by holding a pen on a piece of paper by not, and, and, and doing a continuous curve without looping back and without giving two values uh, on the vertical axis for one value there in the horizontal. In other words, for mathematically speaking, anything you could describe using a polynomial. Now, this is very disappointing to them because it meant, well, in fact, we can't draw downward sloping market demand curves unless, unless we assume two things. First of all, all consumers have identical preferences, and secondly, all goods are the same. Now, that is sheer nonsense. In fact, it's proof by contradiction that they can't derive the downward sloping market demand curve. But because they're so wedded to the idea that it's there, they invented this thing they call the representative consumer. So this representative agent nonsense came out of a failure to reach a conclusion they wish to derive. Most of them have got no idea of this. So that they do this, and, and to, to, to backtrack a bit, why, of course, we, I'm not saying market, actual market demand curves have any shape at all, if you could actually ever derive one of them. What it's saying is that they can't derive one using their theory. So something they leave out of their theory has to be essential to explaining why demand for goods falls as price rises. And what their theory leaves out is the distribution of income. That's, per that's, that's a perfect, that's, that's a perfect, perfect. That's a perfect uh, segue into our next question. You were, you were mentioning these neoclassical assumptions um, and just neoclassical conventional mainstream economics fails to bring class analysis into the picture. And we know um, just from your prior work and interviews that you do have some criticisms of Marx, but what, do, what, what are your feelings about, about Marx's work? You mentioned him earlier. What do you think he contributed to political economy generally? Well, he contributed an enormous amount, which unfortunately was ignored because he tried to preserve the labor theory of value. And uh, what Marx did, Marx, of course, began as a Hegelian not, not trained by Hegel specifically, but a Hegelian philosopher. And he then realized when he was working, I've forgotten the name of the newspaper, but working for a newspaper and covering the uh, peasants being, uh, being excluded from the Black Forest, he realized that power and capitalism is what he should have studied. So he started reading the classical political economists, starting with uh, Smith, and he regaled against the labor theory of value initially, seeing it as a dehumanizing, but ultimately he accepted the whole idea and he, he pushed the labor theory of value further than Ricardo had done to explain the source of profit. But in the, in the middle of writing the Grundrisse, which is the rough draft of capital, he was by sheer chance given, I think he was given, he's, he's given back his copy of Philosophy of Right and, and rewrited that, reread that while he was reading all the classical economists yet again to write Das Kapital. And he started integrating his Hegelian philosophy with his analysis of economics. And what he argued there uh, was, was a different, I, I won't try to elaborate here unless you actually want me to, but he elaborated a different explanation for why labor is the source of surplus. His initial explanation was that there's uh, labor, with the, the commodity labor is sold, uh, and the, to, to maintain the commodity, you've got to pay its, its means of subsistence, so you pay a subsistence wage. You get labor power, the capacity to work. That's not limited to the amount of uh, time necessary to produce your subsistence goods. There could be a gap between the two, and that's where surplus comes from, and there's no other commodity where there's a difference between commodity and commodity power. Therefore, this unique aspect of labor explains why it's exploited by the capitalist and there's a sort of surplus. In fact, he then developed a second explanation, which says that capitalists buy things for their use value. Everybody buys anything for their use value, which is normally qualitative. Capitalists buy workers for their use value, which in this case is quantitative, the capacity to work for X number of hours. They have to pay the exchange value. Exchange value is always quantitative. In the case of the worker, that's, again, subsistence. So the gap between the quantitative use value, which means you can work, say, 12 hours a day in a factory, and the quantitative exchange value that it might take six hours of labor in, 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 in a sort of aggregated way to produce all the goods you need to stay alive, that six-hour gap between the source of surplus, and hence that's why labor is a source of surplus value, and that's a positive rather than a negative reason for saying labor is a source. But I looked at it and said that's a perfectly good explanation for why machinery is a source of surplus as well. Exactly the same arguments apply to machinery, and indeed they also apply to energy, which I'm now incorporating in my theories. So 
I saw that as being a, a brilliant way of giving us a, a different theory of value to what the neoclassicals had, much more legitimate, much more based on what actually happens in capitalism rather than this stylized barter system in, in you know, northern New Guinea, which is the only way the neoclassical model of exchange makes any sense. Uh, but it, it, that theory actually ends up un, under, undermining the argument that socialism is inevitable because you lose the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Now, unfortunately, because Marx was so wedded to this notion that capitalism was necessarily going to fail, and most Marxists were equally wedded to that ideological conclusion rather than logical one, uh, Marxists buried themselves trying to solve the insoluble problem with the labor theory of value. And my feeling is, throw the, throw the junk out. It's just as bad as the neoclassical notion. Let's use Marx's philosophy to build a sound foundation for a modern dynamic analysis of capitalism. It won't necessarily conclude capitalism is going to go extinct, but I think you know, 40 years after or thereabouts after the fall of the, the, uh, well, the uh, Berlin Wall, we've got to admit that inevitability isn't looking so crash hot, even though capitalism is looking pretty shit at the moment as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And Marx also had a lot to say about capitalism in terms of its inherent um, instability and its, and its tendency towards crisis. Uh, there is a consensus among mainstream economists towards the beginning of the new millennium that the business cycle was essentially over. Um, explain for us and for our audience what the business cycle is, why economists believe that they had found a cure for it, and what they fundamentally missed in their analyses. Yeah, well, the basic idea of a business cycle is that there are booms and slumps and slumps in capitalism. There appears where there will be uh, over full demand, there will be periods where there are massive uh, periods of un under demand. And uh, Marx identified that very, very well, actually, in Chapter 25, I think Section 1 or Section 3 of Chapter 25 of Volume 1 of Capital, with a brilliant little explanation of why it happens. And it's not the only reason for a trade business cycle, but it's a good one. And he said that if you have a booming economy, the boom will mean that workers can demand wage rises, because they can demand wage rises in the two-class system Marx was using. Uh, that necessarily means profit falls. With profit falls, because capitalists are motivated by profit to invest, they stop investing. That drop in investment means the amount of demand for labor falls. And the amount of demand for labor falls, workers ultimately find their wage rises, wage levels falling. Because their wage levels fall, that restores profit share, and you get a cycle again. That was Marx's explanation. And... Uh, I took that and I added the existence of debt to build my model of Minsky. So that's, that's one brilliant explanation for cycles. Another one comes from Schumpeter, and Schumpeter argues that innovation is what drives the cycles, and capitalist innovation tends to occur in clumps for a simple reason, again, that if you come up with, uh, let's say you're the first person to invent, I don't know, let's call it a, a digital piece of currency. Maybe let's even call it, say, like a, a, a cryptocurrency. You invent a cryptocurrency, and because that cryptocurrency appears to succeed, lots of people then try to make rival cryptocurrencies, and there's a, suddenly a bubble in cryptocurrencies. Uh, so these, and then of course, when they, when it comes to fruition, only a few of them are going to succeed. Uh, and when they come on the market, they undermine their competitors. In this case, supposed to be fiat money, so there going to be a slump in all those producing fiat money, and you get booms and slumps coming in a technological cycle. That's from Schumpeter's contribution. There are other versions as well, cycles driven by, by uh, even inventories. And what I've added, this is working on Hyman Minsky's work, is cycles driven by credit. So all this stuff means capitalism is an inherently cyclical system. And what the neoclassicals leave out, they've got this obsession about believing that if it wasn't due to exogenous shocks, capitalism would be in perfect stability all the time, perfect equilibrium. And for that reason, they see uh, the crises as being due to being hit by big shocks rather than small shocks. And since you can't predict the shocks, uh, you can't predict the business cycle either, but the business cycle to them is just the, the reactions of a smooth equilibrium tending system to being hit by random shocks. Now that's crap. And of course the argument that it's actually endogenous, uh, which Marx was part of, has been well and truly resurrected by the financial crisis and its aftermath. But the neoclassicals, of course, are trying to restore back their nonsense equilibrium vision. Yeah, and I just want to make it really clear for our listeners what you're saying, which is probably not what most people think about when they think of what economists do. But economists literally do not what you're saying include um, the activity of money, banking, um, or debt into any of their models. And, and I think this is a good segue into our, our next question, uh, which is, 
Can you tell us uh, who Hyman Minsky was? I know he was very influential on your work, as you just mentioned, and obviously is prominently featured in your book. What's his relevance for economics and your work particularly, and how does this radically change from orthodox, uh, orthodox economics? No, I can actually give a bit more background for an audience like you've got uh, yourselves, because Hyman Minsky's parents uh, were Mensheviks, and uh, they, did, they met actually in Chicago, I believe, but they were driven out of Russia, the R- Russian Mensheviks, by the Bolsheviks, uh, and therefore they were they sort of were very well and truly acquainted with Marx, but critics of the Bolshevik attitude, you can have, you know, build socialism on a feudal, a feudal background. Uh, and then when Hyman was born, he, he was born not long before the um, Second World War. He was old enough to actually enlist at the end. He came back, did a mathematics degree, undergraduate mathematics degree, then did a PhD under Joseph Schumpeter. And with the background he had with his parents, uh, and being, having a Marxist background, uh, he was quite prone to see capitalism as an unstable system. And, of course, they, which is also, they came over, I mean, he was born you know, sometime around the Great, the Great Depression. He lived through that as well. And so the question he set himself uh, as his intellectual question is, what causes Great Depressions? And his perspective there was very, very simple. He said, because capitalist economies can find themselves in this state, to model them, you must have models in which crises can actually occur. And that case, therefore, the neoclassical model in which crises cannot occur or only due to something outside the system is not a model of capitalism. So what he tried to build was a model which could explain how the Great Depression occurred. And I think really that comes down to the, the, this, is, this is a very good way of, of working out what economic theories are about. What question drives the initial theory? And the neoclassical question is how does a system of, uh, of markets reach equilibrium with no outside, in, an outside intervention? That's their system, which ends up have, of course, having them being anti-government and, uh, and believing you can have perfect competition and all this sort of nonsense. Marx, uh, Marx's question was how, what's going to lead to capitalism ending. Well, it hasn't. It may well one of these days, but I think that was not quite the right question. Minsky's was what leads to Great Depressions? And that's an extremely good question. That's the one that he answered successfully with a verbal model. And what I did was turn that verbal model into a mathematical one. Um, thank you for that. I mean, it, you, you mentioned it prior as well. I mean, what, one of the big things is, <clears throat> you know, the entry point in which you begin to develop your, uh, your questions have as much of an impact as, as where, you, where you arrive in the end of it. Um, but, you know, you brought up the idea of private debt and the effects that it can have on, on that. And, you know, I'm sure that you've seen there's been reports coming out finally that credit card debt has now topped a trillion dollars in the United States, um, there's you know a couple of economists who are on uh, the different news networks who are saying that there's nothing to worry about if you were to take this debt and uh, you know look at it in terms of uh, GDP per capita, the rate's actually smaller than it was before 2007. Um, can you lend some of your thoughts as to what someone who's reading those headlines uh, should be thinking? Yeah, well, the, the, the reason the mainstream doesn't know what they're talking about with money is their model of banks is what I call the Ashley Madison model of banks. And that, you know, what Ashley Madison does. I'm proud of you. you said I can use four little words here? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Well, Ashley Madison won't actually fuck you, but will introduce to somebody else who wants to <laughs> fuck you for a fee. And that's why, and that's pretty much the, the model they have of banking. Banks don't actually lend you money, but they'll introduce to somebody else who will lend you money, and they'll charge you a fee. And in that case, what's going on in terms of um, uh, banking is that it's, it's fundamentally, you know, what happens behind people's bedrooms. You shouldn't interact. The state shouldn't be involved, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't mean the intriguing thing in their model is that because you have one non-bank agent leaning to another non-bank agent and the bank charging a fee to make its own money out of it, there's no money created. That's their model. Uh, they have a couple of other contradictory models as well, but all of them basically end up saying the amount of money in existence is either determined by the government uh, or, uh, or the bank, so the banks are just like the tools of the government, or the banks themselves can't create money at all, which is what the loanable funds thing argues. Um, now, that's total nonsense because banks do lend money, and the school of thought that I've been part of, which has resisted now for at least 50 years, uh, call themselves endogenous money versus exogenous money. Uh, we see the mainstream as having a model of exogenous money because money effectively drops from government, government helicopters onto the countryside. That's Milton Friedman's model. 
but endogenous money doesn't really explain what the hell we're talking about. So I've given it a different title. I call it Bank Originated Money and Debt, which has a great acronym of BOMD. Uh, and what that means is when the bank creates, when a bank lends you money, it doesn't actually lend you money. It creates money because it says you want to buy, let's say you want to buy a house in, in Houston during the bubble. And they say, oh, that's a great idea. Here's a million dollars, which we're going to credit your bank account with, so you can actually give that to the vendor and buy the house for a million dollars. Uh, and we're going to also record you owe us a million dollars on the asset side. So when the bank creates the asset which is for itself, which is the loan, it creates a liability for itself, which becomes your asset, which is the money with which you buy the house. It's actually created money, and you then spend that money, so that credit becomes an addition to aggregate demand. There's, whereas the neoclassicals believe that all demand... Uh, credit just simply swaps demand from the person, the lending agent, to the borrowing agent, doesn't actually create any more money. And that one person's increase in capacity to buy is offset by another person's fall in capacity to buy. That's their basic model. So they ignore credit. Now, of course, that's totally wrong when, when credit actually adds to demand. And the real punchline for something like the financial crisis in 2008 is that when the banks, um, when the banks uh, started cutting back on loans and when people tried to repay their debt and when people went bankrupt, credit went from being positive to negative and the size of the turnaround was huge. It went from, credit went from being equivalent to 15% of GDP in 2008 to being equivalent to minus 6% in 2010. So effectively you had a 20% fall of demand, aggregate demand in the economy. That's what caused the financial crisis. Now neoclassical is completely blind to that because they think, well, credit doesn't add to any demand. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think you very elegant, elegantly um, just exploded the 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 myth that is sort of circulated throughout mainstream economics, which a lot of mainstream economists will just say that banks are merely uh, intermediaries. But I, I want to back up just for a second to make sure that people really understand this, because I think it's a, a very important point. Can you just can you just explain again exactly how money is created? Yep. Uh, well, let's, let's start with actually if you actually created a bank in the very first instance. Let's say you raised uh, $10 million and you're going to start a bank in, I don't know, let's say Western Samoa. I'm actually using an example I know of. Uh, with that $10 million, you have $10 million in equity. You have zero assets and zero liabilities. So you've nobody, nobody's got a deposit account. Deposit accounts are liabilities for you. You haven't given a loan to anybody, so there's no um, there's no... There's no assets for you either. So if somebody comes along to you and says, I've got this great idea for buying a house in Houston, and it's a million dollars to buy the house, then you say, oh, here's a million dollar loan, so you've got a million dollar in assets, here's a million dollar uh, deposit, so you can buy the house, and we've now got 11 million, you now got, um, you've now got your equity is 10, 10 million, you haven't touched your equity yet, but you've created a million dollars in loans and a million dollars in liabilities. You can keep on doing that until such stage uh, if you're a conservative bank, because you have, let's say, you've got $100 million worth of loans, you've still got $10 million worth of equity. You've created 10 times as much loans as you have equity and 10 times as much deposits as well. So you've used that initial equity to create money. Now, what happens uh, during a bubble is the banks get more and more speculative about how much money they're willing to create. So you might get to the stage where the ratio of, of loans to equity is 30 to 1. Now, in that situation, if 3% of your buyers actually see, find that they um, can't spend money anymore, then you can go bankrupt because a 3% fall in the value of your equity when you have $300 million worth of loans, uh, start leave it out of $10 million of initial equity, that 3% failing is equal to your equity and you go bankrupt as a bank. So I think I've got a bit complicated there, yeah. pardon me. But the basic idea is banks create money by creating a loan simultaneously, and the limit to how much they can do that is not the amount they've got in reserves, which is completely irrelevant to the amount of lending they can do. It's actually based on how much leverage they're willing to have against their equity base. And the more lever they get, the more they're likely to get in a situation of being able to be wiped out by a small downturn in the value of assets, which is what happened in the financial crisis. Yeah. Yeah, you nailed that. And I, so now I want to talk about public debt. So the, the, the debate, we're based in the States, obviously, and the debate around Washington here revolves around this hysteria over what policies and spending will impact the national debt. 
or deficit and the question of how are we going to pay for it. I, I want to ask you a question that's probably mostly associated with modern monetary theory, the macroeconomic theory that shows how governments like the U.S. have a national currency that's fiat money where there are really no fiscal limits to how much a sovereign currency issue, issuing nation can spend given you have the real resources to do it. Um, a lot of our listeners uh, beforehand had this question, so there were probably four or five people who asked the same thing, but I want to give a Twitter shout out to Rob's Noise who, who asked it first. But let me ask you this. So it's hotly contested between modern monetary theory economists and other heterodox economists and mainstream economists. Uh, the question of do federal taxes fund federal spending and are taxes needed for revenue? And I'm talking about in countries specifically like the United States, the UK, Canada, Japan, China, Russia, and Australia, where, where they all have sovereign currencies. Yeah, it's it's complicated for people to get their heads around this because they, what they tend to do is extrapolate what they know about a household or the government. And this is where you see people are going to run out of money and people won't accept their bonds anymore and so on and so forth. And what the modern monetary theory group is saying, which is based on sim very simple accounting, is to say, well, first of all, what is money? And money fundamentally in the modern world is not gold. Uh, it's bank accounts. It's what's in your bank accounts. And how is it created? Well, a bank simply records an asset uh, when it gives you a loan, makes an additional liability for itself, which is your deposit. It's created money that way. The government does the same thing. Uh, so you think, just backtrack on that. Banks are creating money when their new loans exceed repayments. And in a growing capitalist economy, that will normally be the case. In fact, for America's case, right from 1945 until 2007, loans exceeded repayments every year. So the level of credit was growing every year. So banks create money by lending out more than they get back in repayments. And nobody ever says, oh, dear, you can't do that. You can only do that what you've currently got. Okay? People, ex people accept, well, the neoclassicals think banks lending out what they've got because they've got this false model of loanable funds. But in reality, most of us know that banks lend out more each year than they get back in repayments, and that's just what a bank does, and a bank has to do that if it's in a growing economy. Well, a similar thing applies to government. The government has its own... The, the, the difference about the government is the government owns its own bank, and we accept any money that's, trans, that's, that's created by that central government bank in our bank accounts as money. Nobody objects to it because where did it come from? Uh, they don't ask that question. So when a government um, wants to spend money and let's say it's worked out that it's going to spend let's say even 10 percent more than it gets back in tax revenue a particular year it will then issue bonds equivalent to that 10 percent more of of revenue going out than coming in and if we go back to the obama stimulus the size of the obama stimulus is actually about 10 percent of gdp so we had a very substantial amount of money more than the government was getting back in taxation which is being spent into existence by the Obama administration, both in deliberate programs like cash for clunkers and also just because they were getting much less money in, in, in taxation and paying up much more in unemployment benefits. So that's your, that's your basic situation. Now, what actually happens to pay that off? Well, when Congress passes the supply bill of the government, the central bank, of course, in your case, the Federal Reserve, immediately regards the government as having the money equivalent to the value of the bonds. So if you issued 10% of GDP worth of bonds to find finance government spending, which is 10% of GDP more than its taxation revenue, as soon as the bill is passed, the government can spend the money. Now, what it does to spend the money is the bonds are... It, it, so the government can spend 10% more of GDP than it gets in in tax, and it does it. How is it actually financed? Well, the central bank issues those bonds and it effectively also underwrites the bonds. So if it was the case that only, say, 10% of the bonds were sold, effectively the central bank would operate as the underwriter for the other 90% and simply record that you've got the money in your account. We've bought 90% of the bonds. 10% have been bought by the private sector. You can spend 100% of the value of the bonds. Now, in fact, what happens, and this happens even when bonds are yielding virtually zero, the finance sector always buys everything on issue. In fact, they're normally oversubscribed. And the reason that the people do that, even you're buying bonds for giving you lousy yields, is the central bank is forever involved in what are called open market operations. It's buying and selling bonds off the 
uh, financial sector all the time. If you don't have the bonds in the first place, you can't participate in that trade. And in fact, because of the fluctuations, even though they're very, very tiny, the fluctuations in the, in the valuations of those bonds over time through the buying and selling operations, you miss out on a large amount of the potential trading profits you can make as a financial corporation. So the bonds are always fully subscribed. The government always gets the money that it wants. And when it, if the government, if the central bank actually buys, let's say it buys 50% of those bonds through its open market operations off the financial sector, it creates that money exactly the same way that a private bank does by putting a deposit in your account. It will recreate the money in the financial sector's account. And when it doesn't do that, when the bonds are simply sold to the financial sector, completely sold to them, and the central bank doesn't buy any of them, what is actually going on there is a transfer of money from the financial sector to the real economy. Because that 10% of GDP spending means the current amount of money equivalent is, trans is bought, paid by the financial sector to the government, and the government then spends it on the real economy. So a deficit actually means money coming out of the financial sector and going to the real economy. If, on the other hand, you're trying to run a surplus, it goes in the opposite direction. So people's understanding of this is completely screwed up by making an analogy to households uh, and the government. You know, you're not you're not like a, the household is not like a government because if you were, you'd have your own printing press, which people would accept. <laughs> Of course, that's not the case. The government's in a very unique situation. And what modern monetary theory says is it should use that situation to boost demand when it's insufficient to employ, when private sector demand is insufficient to employ everybody who wants a job. Let's get into let's get more into the central banks. I mean, for the past decade or so, their 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 main policy agenda has been what's called quantitative easing, which is supposedly supposed to this method's supposedly supposed to stimulate the economy. Um, can you frame it in, in a very, um, you know, uh, accessible way for people to understand exactly what quantitative easing is, and then maybe we can get into what what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, well, I'll start off with what they why they did it because pa partially because they believe this theory that that uh, central banks, um, uh, that, that, that rather private banks need reserves to lend. A large part of the thinking was, well, if we pump reserves into the private banks, that'll give them money they can lend out and that'll stimulate the economy. If you look at Obama's speech in 2009 talking about why he rescued the banks, he actually says literally that, that a dollar in banks can result in $10 of loans to the real economy, a multiplier effect which can stimulate demand far more than giving it directly to the public. Total bullshit because that's not how banks actually lend. That's part of their logic. A second part of the logic was, if we buy bonds and all sorts of bonds, and the government bonds, short-term and long-term duration government bonds, and also mortgage-backed securities from some of these shonky things we call banks. That buying of money will mean – buying of bonds will mean that they've suddenly their, their bonds go down. The amount of income earning capacity they've got from the bonds also goes. They've got cash instead. They'll use the cash to buy shares. That will drive up share prices, making those people who own shares feel wealthier. They'll spend money and will get, we'll get a, a stimulus to the economy out of what they call a wealth effect. So that was their overall logic. Now, to run through it step by step, in the American case, the scale of, uh, of quantitative easing was $80 billion a month, which meant that every month this Federal Reserve was promising it would be $80 billion on the buy side of bonds, which is a trillion dollars a year worth of bonds they were going to buy off the private financial sector. Now, when you buy a billion dollars worth of bonds, let's just work very simply here and imagine that that billion dollars of bonds was then used because this financial sector had $1 billion with less of bonds and $1 billion more of cash, and they couldn't buy the bonds because the government had already done that, they'd buy a billion dollars worth of shares. If that then drove share prices up by a billion dollars per year, then the people who owned the shares would sell them, let's say, and they might use $900 billion left to buy other assets. They might inflate houses a bit and go back into other shares. And they might spend $100, million, $100 billion of that, you know, buying a few minor consumer items, like the odd Lamborghini, a couple of yachts, maybe some attendants to work on it, some people able to clean the cars for you and so on. So 10% of that money might have turned up stimulating the real economy, but 90% of it goes into inflating asset prices. And that's what QE has actually done. It's made the wealthy wealthier and, uh, and dribbled out for the poor. It's been a very ineffective, in terms of bang for your buck, you may have got 10% of the bang and, and most of the bucks have gone to the wealthy exaggerating, making it even worse, the inequality that was driven by the financial crisis in the first place.
Yeah, so the prevailing line in, in the media or the academic academic economic community is basically that this this money is somehow going to stimulate the the broader economy. But what you're saying is it mainly goes into into assets. So I, I we know from re reading your work, Professor Keen, that that you have a, a different method of, of how you think quantitative easing could be applied. Yeah, I, I believe you call it QE for the people. Could you explain? Um, we want to get a little bit more into prescriptions here and what what a lot of people who are a lot of people who listen to this podcast, a lot of activists, uh, people who are, are who are involved. Uh, what sort of thing can people start to demand and how could QE be used differently? Well, I, I think that the, the main thing to think about is that as well as having workers and capitalists, we have creditors and debtors in this economy. And by far the most important social clash these days is not between workers and capitalists, it's between the financial sector and the rest of the economy. Because what's happened in the last 50, 60 years, say, say 70 years since the Great Depression and the Second World War ended, is that the level of debt, private debt, has risen to the highest it's been in the history of humanity. And like in America's case, it wasn't all that high compared to some of the other countries. But private debt in America went from about 35% of GDP in 1945 to 170% shortly after the financial crisis. It's now down to about 150%. But with that huge amount of credit of debt in the economy, first of all, the, the rentiers in our social system, the, 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 the financial companies, which don't actually create the wealth, but the, the debt that they've got gives them a charge on the income being generated by the wealth creators, the workers and the capitalists in our economies, they're getting an absolute fortune. The rest of us are getting a small amount and also our willingness to, at one stage, let's just to put some numbers on that, uh, I think by 2007, 50% of the profits of capitalist America were going to the financial sector. That's far too high. That's the parasite. That's not a productive sector. So you want to get that level down. Um, and if you go back in history and look at what's actually happened with the history of debt and credit over the millennia, uh, way back in the very, very earliest civilizations, credit was also the basis of, uh, of exchange. And because money rates were usurious and most lending was done around the crop cycle, uh, what you'd have over time is people would be unable to pay their, pay their debts. They'd become uh, a slave, a debt slave of the landowner. And as that happened in the Sumerian Empire, which is the first major empire in humanity's history, uh, that meant that the number of people who could be recruited to fight in the army was falling because the army could only consist of freemen. So the rulers of Sumer were faced with this dilemma. Uh, if we let the levels of debt continue accumulating, we won't have an army to defend the empire. Simple solution, execute the moneylenders. And then over time what became institutionalised was a jubilee. Every 49 years or every change of ruler, all debts would be written off and even the Romans had this in their constitution. And in fact, a lot of the battles uh, leading up to, to Caesar uh, and, the, and the formation of the empire were over the creditors trying to prevent debt jubilees. So we need to bring back debt jubilees. And it's actually easier in our time than it was back in the ancient times because rather than money lenders and all those sorts of things, we have banks using double entry bookkeeping to create money and debt. We have the government which can also use double entry bookkeeping to create fiat money without debt for the recipient and with debt that it can finance with its own bank as well. We could use the government's capacity to create money to give people money directly into their bank accounts. And with the, with the limitation that if you're in debt, you, you were simply used to repay your debt, so debt levels fell that way. Lots of complications, of course, in the background, given all the ludicrous caveats that are a part of uh, financial instrument creation these days. So I'm not saying it's simple, but I'm saying that you could actually, technically, it can be done. That's, so debtors get their debts reduced, but it goes across the economy in a per capita way. So people who are savers, who don't have any debt, get the money as well. Now, I would, given the fact that corporate debt is also quite high and you want to reduce corporate debt too, I would include in that that therefore the savers can use that money to buy shares which must be used by the companies to cancel their debts. Now what you do out of this is a whole range of things. First of all, you drastically reduce the level of private debt. You go back to a level where the economy hasn't got the millstone around its, its, you know, around its ankles when it's trying to run 100 metres of huge amounts of debt that it has to service. Secondly, you'd have more credit-based demand because the banks would lose a lot of influence out of this, but they wouldn't lose the capacity to create credit. You'd also have a, um, 
reduction in inequality because as it happens, the inequality is actually driven by the increasing level of debt. And you would have a, a, a democratization of share ownership because since you'd hand out the shares and the money to, to, to buy the shares on a per capita basis, since it would only go to people who didn't have any debt, uh, or had less debt than the money was given out, you'd actually end up with a reduction in the level of inequality of wealth in the society as well, directly, as well as by reducing the level of debt. I mean, you know, thank you for that. It's really great, the work that you're doing to bring in the question of private debt and what to do about it. Um, you know, people looking around in the world notice, I'm sure, uh, very, very quickly that private debt and the level uh, is just rising globally to uh, heights that we've never seen before. If you could reframe what you were just talking about um, and kind of give it the orientation of if someone's looking to do work around this, um, where should they um, be yeah, yeah. their energies? I, 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 would, I would say that the major thing we could be doing these days is campaigning for a modern debt jubilee. And on that front, I'll actually mention a new book coming up by my good friend Michael Hudson, uh, Michael's publishing a book, I think it's coming out in April, and it explains that historically Jesus was actually campaigning against debt, campaigning for a debt jubilee. So let's do Jesus' work and campaign for a debt jubilee. Yeah, and uh, we actually had Professor Hudson on uh, last spring, and um, to see that article for our listeners, I believe it's on Renegade, Renegade Inc. Uh, it's a wonderful piece. Yeah, that's right. But, but Professor Keen, just, just to make it even more concrete and even clearer, um, basically what you're saying is that, we, that people need to be campaigning for a jubilee. Um, where should people focus this? Like a lot of people who are you know, uh, progressive here in the United States, they're focusing on a lot of electoral campaigns. Um, should should people be focusing this in in sort of a multitude of areas? Like, should they be demanding this of not only their politicians but also financial institutions, central banks, etc.? Like, where should where should they really be putting their their area of focus in? If, if oh, you're together. right. There's a lot of areas to go to. I wouldn't just put it down to the political system. I'd also start campaigning with the public uh, about the need the need to democratize money, in so many words. And, you know, that's a campaign you'd be taking in the media, you'd be taking with some financial institutions which themselves are okay on this front. For example, uh, one of my good friends over here, a guy called Andy McNally, uh, has written a book called Debt Onada. So, you know, Debt Onada, but D-E-B-T, Debt Onada. And he was a, a head of a merchant, a, 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 what they call a, a boutique bank for a while, and became highly critical of debt and its damage it did to people uh, and, and as well as its inflexibility when you wanted to give money to people with that many assets. And he argued we should have not debt-based banking, but equity-based banking. And he's formed a company called Equitain precisely to that end. So you can find people in the finance sector will actually be agree with you uh, that things are totally rotten there and need to be reformed. Um, so, there's, so campaigns have been taken on a whole lot of fronts, but a huge part of it is the public has to learn how money is actually created now. Uh, because if they don't learn it, uh, they're going to be continued hit by the myths that the mainstream economists have created to maintain their fantasy approach to economics. And those myths then disempower people and, frankly, are also responsible for a large part of the increase in private debt because part of their theory, uh, called the Medigliano-Miller hypothesis, says that uh, the level of debt uh, versus equity doesn't matter. And in fact, if you pay taxes and you get an interest rate deduction on the tax payments, your best situation is to be 100% debt, debt financed. So this theory has also led to the situation in which the economy now finds itself. So we have to campaign for education, we have to campaign for the politicians, and try campaigning with the financial sector, and try to persuade some progressive groups as well. This is much cleverer than just getting involved in straight-out wage bargains and fights, fights like that, sort of worker capitalist stuff. Uh, because when I look at it in terms of the, the complex systems analysis that I've done of the financial crisis, ironically, even if I have a model in which the, the bank, the workers borrow no money and the firms are the ones borrowing the money, it turns out that the people who pay for it are the workers because their income share falls precisely in reflection to the increase in the level of debt. So if you want to actually campaign for better working class wages, the best way to do it is to reduce private debt. And so you mentioned, um, and thank you for that. It's uh, <laughs> it's very refreshing to have an economist who can also think about how to make the work that they're doing actionable. So I re really appreciate that. 
framing. Um, we do have a question from uh, from one of our listeners, uh, Francisco Pacheco, who um, was kind of concerned with the role of worker ownership and its potential for transforming the economy. You you did mention democratizing uh, the financial sector as well as a broader economy. Can you give some thoughts on perhaps uh, credit unions and that kind of structure? I know that in a campaign, um, there's one thing to have a message. There's another. Th it's another thing to have an alternative to point towards. Yeah, um, that's a good point. So if you yeah, could so speak a little bit on that. Certainly, credit unions. So, yeah, credit unions and things like that are a very sensible idea. Community-owned systems that distribute money to the community, often without creating money themselves. So uh, Richard Verner is the expert on that. If you take a look at Richard Verner's work, he's arguing for a, a effectively creating an ecosystem of financial systems. Rather than thinking it's getting four giant you know, corrupt firms like the Goldman Sachs of the world and so on. Uh, you have a whole distribution of different types of banks, community-owned in some cases, lending for specific purposes and others. That's a good idea. But the overall of community of, of worker ownership also relates to things like the Mondragon uh, cooperatives in Spain. And these were started you know, decades ago, I think, by a Catholic priest who saw all these unused factories and said we need to get them started again and formed a workers cooperative to buy one of the factories and over time the Mondragon experiment which is worker owned and there are all sorts of systems involved there to stop um, cliques forming and redistribute the control of the different people there are problems with it as well but the Mondragon region of the world has been growing faster than any other part of any other region of the world for something like 30 or 40 years so it works, worker ownership works, but it's difficult to manage. It's not straightforward to be both the worker and the boss. So they've got lots of complicated lessons to learn. But that, that idea of worker ownership, I think, is also something we need to campaign for. But the main thing is attack the financial sector by getting the level of debt reduced, which we can do easily once people understand how money is created. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to follow up, um, even forms of worker ownership, they may not take the, um, the particular form of a worker co-op, but instead like an employee stock ownership uh, plan or what's sometimes known as a ESOP. What are your thoughts on that? I know that, you know, for example, people make the point and it's a correct criticism, you know, Exxon, it, you know, has that exact kind of program. So it may not deliver an end, but in terms of a mechanism for, for broad distribution of wealth, um, is, is that also another alternative that people it's, can... It's, it's another option. I mean, I, I like the idea of, um, of setting up systems that increase the amount of equity we have in the economy because one, one element of, like a lot of left-wing criticisms of capitalism is that the work is being exploited by the capitalist. When you look at it, that's not true. It's equally not true that the capitalist is being exploited by the worker. Capitalists and workers together exploit the free energy we find in the universe. If we didn't have the energy in the first place, this conversation wouldn't be possible and neither would life. Um, so energy is what we're exploiting. On that basis, we, are, as the workers, are getting back far more energy out in our wages than we actually put in because we're exploiting the stuff we find for free and you know i don't mean i don't mean we don't pay pay for it but the, we didn't we didn't build the sun it happened to be there the coal was created we're exploiting those free resources and turning those into goods and services so that perspective the whole worker capitalist thing goes out the window uh, equally so if you can see what's going to happen with with uh, technology over time where i am one of the people who believe we're going to have almost no need for labor so the capacity of the vast possible vast majority of the population to get an income because they labour is no longer going to be possible. So we need to campaign on other fronts like a basic, a basic income and as well a debt jubilee because they both go together. So those sorts of campaigns are ones that encourage people to be going into. And it takes, you've got to be more intelligent just than straight out reactive in campaigning. I've seen so much reactive campaigning by the left and if you're going to be in reactive campaigning, the right's going to win because they're more reactive, <laughs> frankly. So in that ironic thing, if you're, not, if you're not cleverer than the left, cleverer than the right, rather, by seeing more than what's one level of analysis, seeing the role of debt rather than focusing on you know, uh, wage campaigns and unionisation, uh, then you're going to have a chance to win. Otherwise, the future I think we face is going to be that of the Hunger Games and not of a democratic society. Yeah, well, mm. Professor Keen, I think uh, probably our listeners are mad at me, but a point, because we are sort of an economics podcast, a point I tend to make is along similar lines, which is that the left has completely forgotten about taking the economy into account in any of their political action, which is pretty amazing if you think about that. Um, but, you know, 
to 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 rewind and and sort of uh, ask you a little bit more of a prov provocative question because we know that you've done well in the past with predicting things that happen in the economy. Um, you sort of, we sort of gone through why uh, you know there's a danger when uh, private debt to GDP um, is is high. Um, you know, that's what toppled essentially the U.S. economy, as you explained in 2007, 2008. What's going on today? Um, is something similar to that building up here in the U.S. Uh, and, and, and Europe? Um, or, or is it happening in other countries? What are your sort of forecasts? And if you could specifically give us a few spicy predictions for, for what's going to happen here. On our, on our okay, well, look, I'll start with a, a plug for my book, of course, which is what the, that was actually about, the last book called Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? So on that book, I went through uh, saying what caused the last financial crisis and fundamentally comes down to two things, too much private debt and credit growing, being, which is the change in private debt also being too high, and then you have a plunge which causes a downturn. So a number of countries went through that, and I call them all the walking debt of debt because they've already been zombified. And that, so the very first country was Japan back in 1990. Its peak level of private debt, by the way, was 225% of GDP versus America's peak of 170%. Uh, so they got zombified. Then along comes America, UK, Spain, uh, Ireland, most of, most of, of Europe. Uh, was on before, except for Germany and, the, and Austria and so on, uh, which run trade surpluses and actually have low levels of private debt. So that's you, those are you what I call walking debt of debt. The ones that managed to survive the crisis did so by continuing to borrow more private debt. Uh, your northern neighbour is one of them, Canada. Canada's debt level went from about, I think, about 180% of GDP to 220%. That's what's driven those, as well as foreign housing buyers, that's what's driven those huge property bubbles in Vancouver and so on. So that's the, uh, that's Canada's now avoided the crisis by borrowing more money. Therefore, when it gets hit, the impact of the extra level of debt will be greater than it was even for America. So Canada's one I'm going to see go down. Australia, the same story. South Korea was the, the, the third largest, second, well, the, sorry, this, there's actually China's right at the top, but China has this weird capacity to convert to um, spending public money rather than privately created money, and they're doing that right now on a grand scale. So they, they've got, they're the biggest credit bus we're seeing, but that's being attenuated by the biggest government stimulus, even before the credit crash has become obvious. Canada, Australia, and Korea will not do that. They'll have the crisis before they may have any government response to it. So they're my three biggest picks, but others include uh, Singapore, which is a new entry given the most recent data. It's had a huge rise in debt. Uh, Norway, 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 pardon me, Sweden, Belgium, of all places. Uh, so there's about, I've got between nine and 16 countries that I think are likely to be not like all the, the walking debt of debt, but the zombies to be. So they avoided the crisis by borrowing even more money. The crisis is coming their way, and they're all going to fall over, I think, in the next one to three years. And, and, and China, China's levels are, are, are pretty high as well, um, but they're, they're sort of a unique case. Oh, they're off the scale. I mean, I, uh, just to, I've got this actually on my, on my data page, uh, and my, 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 I've got a Prof. Steve Keen web page, which is not properly developed, but it's getting there. So um, that, that site has a page of data, and the, uh, the, da the data page, if you go to uh, look under crisis slash data, you go, so Prof. Steve Keen, uh, there's a heading called crisis question mark, which is about the book. Click on that and you'll then see data. And click on data, you'll then find with information going back, unfortunately, only to the middle of 2016, there's data on private debt for every country in the world that is the data collected for by the Bank of International Settlements. Now, in that case, you'll see China. If you click on the button for China, you'll see China went from a debt level of about 115% of GDP in 2009 to almost 220% of GDP in 2017. And that's the biggest private debt bubble in the history of capitalism. But it, yeah, but as we know, they're a little bit unique because it's sort of a state-driven system, and the government plays a large role, and it's, it's got all sorts of that's right. assets and yeah. other, other and features. I've, and I've, I've seen, but yeah, but, like, but, I, I mentioned earlier that the Obama stimulus was equivalent to about ten percent of GDP. Uh, I've seen uh, information on some websites, which, as far as I can go in verifying it, that the current scale of the um, 
fiscal stimulus and excessive government spending over, over taxation in China is 15% of GDP. And I then mentioned that to a very good friend of mine who's extremely well placed in multi-billion dollar infrastructure deals, and he said it's bigger. So in that sense, China's doing a stimulus before they even notice they're having a credit crunch. So a lot of people in, the, in, in a lot of our listeners are based in the U.S., they're based globally, but a lot of people in the U.S. are probably sitting here saying, well, if we're not one of the major ones at risk, then maybe we get, we, we get off scotch-free. But what I want to ask you is the, those handful or even larger handful of countries that you just listed, um, if, if, those, if one of those uh, were to go through a crisis or a number of them around the same time, what could be sort of the global impact on that, and what could be the impact here in the U.S.? Well, the, the global impact is, of course, if those countries have a, have a credit crunch, uh, demand drops, and their imports from the rest of the world drops, which means the rest of the world's exports fall, so exporting countries find they're making less money. And, and therefore, that's the direct, direct credit effect of one of these countries having a downturn. The other side of it is... is somewhat related, and that is that total demand in the, global, in the global economy is the turnover of existing money plus credit. This is the mathematical logic I've finally worked out to nail the argument about the role of credit, is that demand in the economy is both the turnover of money you've currently got in your pocket, velocity of circulation times money, plus change in debt, which is equivalent to creation of new money. Now, that creation in debt and sometimes has been running, it's like in America's country, America's case, pardon me, at 15% of GDP before the crisis hit. In China's, it was 40%. At a global level, it say it's 10%. After the financial crisis took out the economy, the credit systems of the UK, the USA, and most of Europe, let's say it's fallen to 5%. It's coming from those remaining countries. Now, if those countries go from 5% to minus 5%, which is you know, smaller scale than... America itself decline, there'll be a global credit crisis. Gotcha. Well, all, all eyes on those countries. Well, Professor Steve Keen, author of Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Pick up the book. Thank you so much for joining Left Out. You're welcome. It was a lot of fun. So thank you for joining us uh, for another episode of Left Out. A really, really special thanks to Steve Keen for being so generous with his time and speaking with us. Please buy the book, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? And we're also going to put a link to his Patreon. Uh, He's like the crowdfunded economist, as he likes to call himself. And he's doing wonderful work there. Uh, You'll gain exclusive access uh, to some of his data, his original articles that are not necessarily accessible to the public. So please go support his work. We'll plug the Patreon link uh, in the show description. Yeah, absolutely. And then also special thanks to Corey Morgart, our audio engineer, Democracy at Work, and all of you uh, listeners and supporters out there. Uh, we also have a Patreon page, and that'll also be in the show description. And we sure. also hope that you click on that too. Um, Really, really excited about the next episode, but not quite sure who or what it's going to be on yet. I mean, we definitely have plans in the works, but we're going to keep it secret for now. Um, but you will know when we know and when it's out. And just uh, just another friendly reminder, we did just launch our Twitter account finally, at Left Out Podcast. We want to hear from you in any capacity. You got some feedback from the show, maybe some ideas for some new guests, anything yeah, you want please. to sort of shoot at us please feel free to do so. Please do it. Thank you again for uh, all of the support, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Left Out.